Good morning. Happy 1st of January. Happy 20... But yeah, we're in again. 2023. So today is 1, 1, 2, 3. And um, I hope that this year is going to be uh, the best year of your life. And I pray that you will be blessed immensely. I pray that you would grow in Christ. I pray that your relationships will be better and stronger and that all good things happen to you today. So my name is Kenyatta. If you are here for the first time, and I'm one of the pastors here at Harvest, if you come back next week, you are not going to see me in this jacket because I am, I'm, I'm wearing this because it's January 1, and you know, that's what we do. We wear our best January 1. You know, like Doc is there in his uh, chief outfit and stuff like that, so that's super great. Um, I want to um, thank, um, if you guys have noticed some signs, we have some new signs. Have you noticed, like when you drive along the highway, have you noticed the new sign? They're really nice, right? They're really cool. Well, uh, the guy who did them is actually here. His name is Derek, right? Where's Derek? Derek, Derek, Derek. Derek, right, yes. And um, Derek did these signs, and he was super great. He was super generous, and the signs look great. And people are uh, talking about it, and he's in church. Thank you for coming, Derek. We love and appreciate you, and thank you so much. And it's also good uh, to see some uh, faces that I haven't seen for a while. And we are in Hebrews chapter uh, 12, so why don't you go there right now? If you don't have a Bible, raise your hands, and one of our ushers will come, and they will get a Bible into your hands. We're starting a new series today, and it's called A Committed Disciple. It's called A Committed Disciple. And our sermon, kicking that series off, is going to be all about commitment. First message in this series, it's all going to be about commitment. So are we there yet? Hebrews 12, everyone? That's somebody calling to find out if they're in church. It's like, are you in church? You invited me. I'm coming. Where are you sitting? So we're going to spend time in three verses this morning. And verse 1 begins, uh, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that it will bring, as you said, light. We pray that it would bring knowledge, understanding, and we pray that our faith will grow. We pray, Lord, for hearts that have been prepared by your spirit, to receive this word. Pray that this word will go forth with clarity and simplicity. And Father, I pray that you would move in our midst today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. The writer of Hebrews, especially here in chapter 12, compares the Christian life to an athletic race, more specifically a marathon. No, if you have never run a marathon before, let me tell you this. From someone who has watched a lot of marathons, 
it is harder. It is real, real hard. And it's a difficult race. And congratulations to um, Tamika on being, I, I didn't even know that, Tamika, that you are the only, Moverton is the only IAAF sponsored event here in Turks and Caicos. So that is a great achievement. And let me encourage you guys, if you want to volunteer, do that. Please volunteer. So running marathons is hard. Those who have actually participated in one, and we have a number of people here in church, will tell you that uh, to run a marathon requires preparation. It requires determination, discipline, and grit. And here's the thing. Living as a follower of Jesus Christ is just as hard, if not more challenging. It requires spiritual discipline, it requires the support of others, and it requires unwavering faith in Jesus Christ. And my hope and our hope here is that this series will act as a source of motivation for you to continue to run the race of faith well and be committed so that you can finish well. Now, by way of context, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36, the author says this, For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Now, after saying this, the writer goes on and in chapter 11, lists the many examples of Old Testament saints who ran the race of faith and finished well. Now, this sets the stage for chapter 12, where we are going to explore, especially in the first three verses, we're going to explore the tools that are needed to finish well. Any successful athlete will tell you this, commitment is key. As a matter of fact, anybody who's ever succeeded in anything will tell you that commitment is key. And since we are running a race of faith, there are certain things that we must commit to. We can't get away from it. There are certain things that we must commit to. And here's the first point, and you were given some um, outlines, and I hope that you're using them. Uh, these things are going to help you as you go over the sermon, as you go over sermons that have been preached in the past. They help you. I know there are persons there who have uh, outlines from four years ago that they have kept, and it's a source of enrichment to them. So write this down in your sermon outline. Commit to being intentional. Now the core of verse 1 is this. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The idea of running in this context or to run is to go after or pursue or be intentional about. As mentioned previously, the race that is being spoken about here is the believer's life in Christ. The word endurance has the meaning of waiting patiently for something even when it gets hard. You're waiting for it, you're expecting it, you're going after it, you're still doing it even when it's hard to do. Now, think of it this way. To run with endurance is to have a mindset that is intentional about your Christian faith. This mindset says, listen, no matter what happens, no matter how tough it gets, I'm going to remain faithful and steady till the end. But being intentional also means that you do the things that help you to live a faithful and fruitful life. Now, I want to say this to those who are running the race of faith. In other words, those who are believers. But I want to tell you before I say this that I love you. Right. And I know that you love me. So this may come across hard. But I want to set that there. 
you will never grow in your faith if you do not commit to the things that help you to grow. If you're not intentional about your faith, you will not grow. If you're not intentional about finishing well, you will not grow. And yet, many of us believers, 5, 10, 15 years, we do the opposite. We are intentional about everything but our faith. So we sign up for gym classes because we want to exercise our bodies. And we get up at 6 o'clock and we go to the gym and we work out. We visit doctor for annual checkups. We go to the dentist to ensure our pearly whites are still there and that when we smile, others are dazzled by its brightness. We budget, which is good. We take classes to sharpen our skills. We go to conferences to become better at our jobs. And all these things are good. All these things are good. But get this, when it comes to our faith, what do we do? The intentionality that we bring to other aspects of our lives disappear. So we attend church once every six weeks. We do not come with other believers in community to grow. We think reading through the Bible is too hard. We think serving is tiring. And then we wonder, why am I struggling with the same sins I did five, ten years ago? Why am I suffering from spiritual defeat after spiritual defeat? Why am I stunted in my spiritual life? And the reason that happens is because we are not running the Christian faith with intentionality. I still love you. Now that is why the author of Hebrews says this. That we need to run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, let me talk to those who are not running the race of faith. In other words, you have not yet placed your faith in Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and you are not following Jesus' path for your life. I want you to consider this. Your life is also like a race. But it's not the race of faith. Some may call it the rat race. In other words, you are on a treadmill and you are going quickly, but you are going to a place called nowhere. And when your race is done, you will stand before God and you will have to answer to him why you chose the rat race instead of the race of faith. But at that time, it's going to be too late for you to change because your destiny would have already been decided. And because you chose to live without God, God is going to honor your choice and he's going to allow you to receive the consequences of that choice. So you are going to live eternally without his grace without his favor, without his love, without his mercy, without his peace, without his blessings, without his protection, without his kindness. But guess what? You will live with this, his judgment and his justice. So loved ones, commit to a better race. Stop that race, that rat race, and commit to the race of faith. And if you have done that, and even right where you are, if you commit in your heart to following Jesus Christ, let me say this to you and to those who are already running the race of faith, we need to commit to living with intentionality. We need to commit to living with purpose. And what a good time to start today. 1st of January, 1st day of 2023, to commit to living your life with intentionality. 
your faith, your Christian life with purpose. Now, in order to do this, you will need to examine your life and see what, if anything, is keeping you back. If anything is keeping you in these starting blocks. Think about this. What do you need to do to run your best race? And a good place to start, and write this down. This is our second point. Write this down on your outline. Commit to cleaning up your life. Commit to cleaning up your life. Now, basketball fans here? Any basketball fans? A few hands. If you're a Lakers fan, you know, cannot put your hands up like this. Okay. Athletics. Some of us, we watch athletics. Yeah. So what happens? Before a game, the players come out, and what are they wearing? Warm-up clothes, right? Tracks. They wear their warm-up clothes. But when the race or the game begins, what do they do? They take those clothes off and they put on their game clothes. In other words, they suit up. Now look at verse 1. It says this. Let us lay aside every weight and sin. In other words, get rid of those things that prevent you from running your race well. Get rid of those things that stop you from running your race well. Or those things that have gotten you into a ditch or sidetrack from running the race. Or those things that make you want to quit the race of faith. Now get this. Cleaning up your life is a personal task. And while you can get help and guidance from others, and you should, the final decision to commit to cleaning up your life rests with you. And let me say this, it requires examination. Like what we are commanded to do before we get to the Lord's table. It requires honesty and a desire to change. Now, in writing to believers from two cities, Ephesus and Colossae, Paul tells these believers to put away or to cast off things that were keeping them from running the race of faith well. These things were holding back these believers from running well. I'm going to put them up on the screen, so look at this list. It's Ephesians 4.25. And pay attention to those sections that have been underlined. Verse 25 starts and it says this. Therefore, having put away falsehood. Now remember he's speaking to believers. This is not. He's out in the marketplace speaking to non-followers. He's speaking to believers. Therefore, having put away falsehood. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupt and talk come out of your mouths but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Now look at what he says to the believers in Colossae. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. 
but now you must put them all away. I want to read that section again because he says this. This is how you were. When you were in the kingdom of darkness, this is how you thought. This is how you acted. This were the things that defined you. However, verse 8, he's saying, but now you must put them away. You used to do this, but now you need to do this. And he goes on. What are the things to put away? Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Now get this, loved ones. This list is heavy. So imagine how further you could go if you lay aside these things and be sure to keep your distance from them. And as you live the life of faith, I want to say this to you. Put away those things that were part of your old life. As you now step into your life of faith, as you are running that life of faith, put these things away so that you could run better, so that you could go further, so that you can finish well. Does anybody know about the plant called the Venus flytrap? Okay, I'm going to have a picture of it on the screen. Are you seeing it? It just looks horrible, right? Let me tell you about the Venus flytrap. It is a carnivorous plant that catches its prey, mainly bugs and insects, by trapping them. So, when an insect lands on a plant, it gets stuck. Its leg or its wing or whatever, it gets stuck. And there's a mechanism in this plant. It's amazing how God created this plant. There's a mechanism in this plant that when that fly or that bee or whatever gets stuck, the first reaction in that insect is to struggle, it's to try to get away. And that triggers something in that plant and it closes in on that insect. Now, here's the funny thing with that plant. Let's say a speck of dust gets onto, onto it, but that doesn't move, so it doesn't close in on that. It is designed to only close when there's first one sensation, and then there's another sensation. So, it closes in on its prey, and when it does... It gradually takes its time. This is a plant for all you vegetarians. It gradually, sorry, I am actually trying to eat better this year. So let me say this, right? I'm going not vegan, but healthy. When this plant, the Venus flytrap, closes in on its prey, it gradually, over time, sucks the life out of that insect until the carcass is left. Loved ones, let me say this to you. That is how sin works. That is how it works. It traps us. And then it sucks the life out of us. And that is why we must commit to cleaning our house and putting sin aside. Now, what does that look like? Well, it's to acknowledge our sin. As a believer, when the Holy Spirit reveals them to you, when the Holy Spirit says, this is wrong, this is not right, you shouldn't say this, you shouldn't think that, you shouldn't do that, it's to acknowledge it, it's to confess it, it's to turn away from it, and it's to do the opposite. And guess what? You have the power of the Holy Spirit to help you do this. You don't have to do this in your own strength. You have the Holy Spirit's power to turn away from that movie, or to turn away from that song, or to turn away from that conversation. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing, here's the thing. 
Not just are we to turn away from doing wrong, but we are to turn to do the opposite. And that's why the text that I just read says, don't lie, speak the truth. Don't give any opportunity to the devil. Don't be a lazy body, do honest work. Repentance is to turn away from, but it is to turn to something else. Now, not only are we to lay aside sins that hold us back, but we are to put off weights that hold us down. And sins and weights are different in this context. A weight may be useful in some instances, but the race of faith is not one of them. So imagine Usain Bolt, and it's the 2008 Beijing Olympics. And he's getting ready to run the 100 meters race. And he comes out in skinny jeans, Timberland boots, and a big trench coat. And he lines up by the blocks. The gun goes off. Is he breaking the world record just like that? Is he winning the race just like that? No, he isn't. That's because he's running with extra weight. That's because he's running with an impediment. And in the same way, as we run the race of faith, we must be careful not to allow weights to hold us back. It's keeping you back from being faithful to God. Thank you. What's the weight in your life? Is there a person that you need to stay away from? Now be careful with this, right? Because as believers, we are to tell others about Jesus. But Walter did such an amazing job when he was praying. I hope you were listening to that. If they are influencing you to do evil, if they're influencing you to turn away, if they're influencing you from running your race well, drop them. Leave them. You see that thing that you used to believe, boy, when I go down here with my partners, boy, we jumping up. Yeah, we in hell. Party like, jo no, there's no party in hell. There's no party, there's no celebration. The Bible tells us there is pain and anguish and torture. So if there's a person who is keeping you back from running, well, drop them. Let me qualify that again. Husband or wife, don't drop them. <laughs> All right? I need to qualify that. Because some of you might go home and be like, oh, I'm going to divorce him because he is keeping me back. That's it. No. And p children, don't do that to your parents. But I think you know what I mean. Walter talked about entertainment. One of the things with Netflix that really gets you is when you're watching a series and that Kong Dong, when you finish one and it goes five, four, three, two, one. It's not normal seconds. You know that, right? It's not like it just goes really quickly and then in the other one starts. If it's leading to temptation, stop it. Conviction is over here, boy. <laughs> I'm feeling it coming. <laughs> right? If it's leading you to temptation, Stop it. No, you might say, okay, what am I to watch? What am I to look at? Guys, let me say this. You know what I've been looking at? And I kid you not. Old black and white Beverly Hillbillies. I'm telling you. 1961, season one. I'm, I'm, I'm watching season one now. Some of the jokes may not be, um, you know, 
They may be canceled now if they were popular. But yeah, if it means that you have to dig a bit deeper, if it means that you have to cut off certain entertainment, do it. Your life is more valuable than that show or that little bump in excitement you get from watching it. Your life is more valuable than that. Your soul is much more valuable. But maybe the thing that's holding you back is a good thing. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's exercise. Maybe it's a hobby, but it is distracting you from faithful service to God. Loved ones, loved ones, clean house. Clean house and put those weights aside. Now, in addition to uh, some of the things that were listed previously, uh, there are some things that consume our lives that we do not see as weights, but we must put them aside if we are to run well. Remember I said a weight is a good thing, it's useful, but if it keeps us back from running well, we need to put it aside. But there are some other things that are not so useful, but it keeps us back. Things like past hurts. You need to take it off. Yes, you were hurt in the past. If you're going to go forward, you have to take them off. You have to take it off. And I know that you're saying, but you don't know what I went through. So you could stand up there in your jacket <laughs> and tell me, put it off. But I am going to hold on to this thing. Loved ones, you don't have to. The Spirit of God is with you to help you. And yes, it is going to be difficult. And yes, you're going to have to walk out of your comfort zone. But you have to put those past hurts behind you. Because if you don't, they will stay with you and they will pull you back and they will keep you from going forward. And you will hit a spiritual ceiling. And you will hit it and hit it and hit it and never go beyond it. Because unforgiveness and past hurts are keeping you stuck. Let them go. Let them go. You have to. Because if you don't, you're not going to be able to move forward. But here's another thing that we need to let go. It's that consumer mindset. This is a mindset that sees church through the eyes of a spectator. A spectator has fun. A few years ago, Walter, Raymond, myself, and Quinton went to watch a baseball game. My favorite team is Atlanta Braves. But we went to watch a Cubs game. Wrigley Field. <laughs> they lost. Badly. I remember the game. I have the tickets still. All right? And we had really good seats, right? And it was fun. But we were spectators. No. It was easy for us to say, boy, he should have catch that. Why is he pitching like that? He should hit that. Another home run. Come on. The empire. Imagine looking at church the body of believers through the eyes of a spectator. You know what happens? We become critical. Why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? If you look at church as a participant, it becomes different. You are involved. You are plugged in. We could do this better. 
I could do this to help. Probably I could support or volunteer or do X or do Y. Loved ones, a consumer mindset, when we apply that to church, is they and them and give me, feed me. A participant is us and we. We are doing this together. I am contributing my gifts and my abilities and my time to make this work. Check this ratio. Criticize. You're allowed to criticize one thing. But you must contribute five things. Okay? You're allowed to criticize one thing, but you're only allowed to do that if you're contributing in five different ways. A few can't do it. It takes all of us. Why church in better? Because you're not helping. It's January 1. I should have prepared a better message than this. <laughs> it's like, boy, I'm going to start this hard. Listen, if you meet me by the terrace after, I buy lunch for you. <laughs> right? If you meet me there. <laughs> and it's only... It's only valid for today. <laughs> Wait, what time the game starting? <laughs> it could be better if we all chip in. It could be better if we all work together. It could be better if we contribute our spiritual gifts. It could be better if we bring our talents together to help. And you heard Carl then mention that we're going to uh, focus on certain ministries, and one of the ministries we're going to focus on is HK. It is amazing what our current HK teachers do with the kids, and what they learn, and how excited they are. But they and we need help, because some of you are gifted with the ability to teach. Our student ministry kind of restarted last year, and we have uh, Sammy and Jelani and Donny, and they are excited, and they love what's happening, and they're really pouring in. We need help, especially females, because they're all guys, and, you know, females just kind of come and sit in a corner, and we need some female leaders to help them. So if you have a passion for young people, or if you complain a lot about young people this and young people that and young people this, there are 10, 15 young people that come together every Friday. Why don't you help by making a difference? And some of these kids are super gifted. They have abilities like joke. They're going to be leaders in any society that they go. Any society that they go, they're going to be leaders. Come and help them. So get off the couch, the spiritual couch, and get into the game. Write this down. Here's our third point. Commit to encouragement. Commit to encouragement. If you're going to live faithfully, you're going to need encouragement. Think of the marathoner who is running, and as he gets to that last few hundred meters, the crowd starts to cheer. And the crowd is going wild, and that encourages him. It's why in sports, home games are an advantage, because the crowd is there. You have heard the phrase, the 12th man, right? This is where the crowd is so active, and they are so involved that they are pushing the players to do better, run faster, go harder. Well, we need encouragement if we are going to run the race well. Look at what verse 1 says. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So let us be encouraged by those saints who have gone before. 
like those saints in, in chapter 11. And they have endured and they have kept the faith and they have finished well. Let's be encouraged by those saints who throughout history have lived and have done well and they have finished their race well. Let us be encouraged by those saints who are living in countries that are closed or hostile to Christianity, but they are remaining faithful under persecution. And let us be encouraged by those believers who surround us on a daily basis and they are living out their faith well. But to receive this encouragement, we need to take steps and be in community with other believers. We need to be in community. We only receive encouragement when we're in community. You know what that means? That means make it your business. Make it your job. Commit to being regular in church. As regular as you could be. Commit to being in a community with other believers. Commit to serving others. Commit to telling others about Jesus Christ. Commit to opening your life to others. Because you're not just going to walk up to a stranger and say, you know what, I have this struggle. I get really depressed around Christmas time. It's really difficult for me. No, you're not going to do that, right? Right? Anybody? No. That looks strange, right? But you commit to the person that you have spent time with. The person that you have rubbed shoulders with. The person that you have picked up garbage with. The person that you have painted with. The person that you have packed a bag of groceries with. The person who has been praying for you and with you. Then you commit to them. So you're only going to receive the benefits of encouragement when you uh, commit to being in community. And then when you commit to opening up. And saying, I need help. I need help. No, by nature, I'm a private person. So when I got sick, 2021, it took the Spirit of God to encourage, not to encourage, it took the Spirit of God to impress upon my heart to open up and tell others what was happening to me. In my own nature, I would never have done that. Some of you have seen the video that um, was done before I went off to the hospital. In my normal self, I would never have done that. Opening up like that was vulnerable to me. And it was difficult. So I feel you if you say it's not easy. But guess what? I have received five years of love and prayers and support and encouragement and laughter and food and soup and cake and chocolate. And then I was going to say Bailey's, but <laughs> I don't want to sell out the person who's given their pastor Bailey's for Christmas. Right? <laughs> but because I was in a community of believers, a loving community, and the Spirit of God strengthened me, it was easier to say, I have cancer. I have stage four cancer, and I'm going to get it operated on. And I'm afraid. I don't know how this is going to turn out. I need your prayers. I need your support. And I need your encouragement. And you poured in. And you prayed. And you loved. And it was amazing. I felt it. If we're going to be encouraged, we have to open up. But we could only open up when we make a choice to be in community. Make that choice, loved ones, to be in community with other believers. Because not only will you receive encouragement, but then you could also encourage others. 
because your skills and your experience and your abilities will encourage others. And we are, are starting a, a, a new discipleship group come September, come January, wait, we're in January. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I love this group. It's not started as yet, but I love it. Because it's going to be a group made up of young men and women, young married couples. People who have been married under 10 years. And they're going to be in a group with a couple being led by a couple and they've been married for decades. And this is a strong couple and they're going to pour into these four, five younger couples and they're going to encourage one another. Marriage is hard. Amen? amen. Men? Look at your wife before you could say amen, right? <laughs> Marriage is difficult, and it's tough, and it's not easy, but we need that encouragement. And this group will come together, and they would cheer, and they would laugh, and, you know, they would go through all of, you know, all of those things, but they are going to be stronger for that. They will encourage one another, and they, in turn, will be encouraged. If you're going to grow well, you need to commit to encouragement. And then this... Write this down. Commit to a new focus. Commit to a new focus. The text says we need to be looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. That means we are to put our focus on Jesus, uh, the one whom our faith is based on. It is faith in Jesus' life, death and resurrection that acts as the foundation for our belief. Jesus is the one who gifted us faith in the first place and he is the one who will bring our faith to fruition and complete it. Many of you may not know this, but I wear glasses. And was it that obvious? But I've been wearing glasses since I was a teenager. How many of you believe that I'm wearing the same pair of glasses that I wore when I was 16 years old? Of course not. Because every year or two, I would go to the doctor and I would get a checkup and I would get new prescription. I would get a new prescription for a new pair of glasses. As I aged, my eye and my eyesight also changed. Ever so often, we need Regular heart checkups because we lose focus. We lose focus. And we need those checkups so that Christ could become our focus because we get distracted. Jesus was right when he told that parable of the four seed, the four soils, which represented four hearts. For some of us, the cares of this world, they're choking out spiritual life. We are busy running to and fro, and it's choking out the spiritual life. And we need to refocus ever so often. We need to constantly be committing to focusing on Christ, especially when things are good. Because when things are going well, arrogance and pride is close by. Because we start thinking, it was my strength. It was my ability. Wow, business booming. It's because of my skill. Or when things are going bad, we tend to look in and we become, um, you know, self-focused. But if it's going good, focus on Christ. If it's going bad, focus on Christ. Because that's the only way we're going to finish the race well. And the one thing I want to talk about, one more thing, last thing, is when we feel discouraged. Especially when we feel discouraged, I want us to focus on turning our mind and our eye to Christ. 
Discouragement occurs when the pressures and burdens of life overwhelm us to the point that we turn to despair. Discouragement has caused many people to quit the Christian race. Discouragement has caused many pastors and preachers to give up on the ministry. John Calvin, great man of God, great man of faith, says this, said this rather, there's almost no day on which some pain or anxiety does not come. This was a proficient thinker, writer, philosopher of the Christian faith. And yet he said this, there's no day when I don't suffer from pain and anxiety. Charles Spurgeon, who was probably, who's called a prince of preachers by some, said this once, discouragement creeps over my heart and makes me go with heaviness to work. It is dreadfully weakening. It is dreadfully weakening. And some of you are feeling the pangs of discouragement. You are hoping that this year will be a new chapter. You are hoping that discouragement will not walk with you as it did last year. And I want to say this to you. Focus on Jesus because he has a plan to deliver you from discouragement. If you turn your eyes to him, if you keep your eyes on him, seeking him, praying, calling out to him, he will help. And he may help in different ways to different people. But he will help you to defeat the giant of discouragement. And I think especially when we are intentional about our Christian faith, when we are uh, intentional about cleaning up our lives, when we are intentional about encouraging others and being encouraged, and when we keep our eyes on Jesus, we together, together will defeat discouragement. Jesus lived a life of obedience, but he lived it depending on the Holy Spirit. We who follow Christ have been gifted the Holy Spirit. So let us depend on him and let us call to him and seek his strength daily to finish our race well. Because when we do, we would say like Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7, I have finished the race. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Notice what he said. I want to read that again. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. This was right before he died. I have kept the faith. My wish is that I would say that. And my hope is that all of us would say that. That we would have finished well by being committed. Let us pray now. Father, thank you for your word. And as the enemy tries to steal that, I pray that your spirit will protect that word, the seed of that word in our hearts. But I pray for more than that. I pray that that word I will bear fruit. Fruit that is multiplied over time. And I pray that your spirit will go with your people and fill them with strength and hope and power and love 
We thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus.